Okay, so I'm so thrilled to be looking at beautiful Rachel Wong in front of me. And you look really good. And I've noticed like a lot of people on these Zoom interviews, they don't bother to dress up or anything. And I, I really appreciate that. You look so <laughs> good. It's part of the new you, I think. But first, let's just start with um, how do you know Valley of the Moon Music Festival? Um, I applied to be an apprentice and I came to the festival in 2017. And it was, um, I heard it from my teacher, Stanley Ritchie. And he said, you have to go to this festival. It's really amazing. And it's definitely right up like what, with what you like doing. And so it Great. was, I keep telling people it was the best festival experience I've ever had. It doesn't matter if it was Baroque or modern festivals. It was just the best two weeks ever. Wow, I'm so glad to hear that. And then you came back um, as, an, uh, as a laureate, as a tank trust laureate once, right? Yeah. And so um, I know that you just won the Avery Fisher Career Grant and I wanna congratulate you. It's a fabulous, I can't imagine a person who deserves it more than you. Um, and are you the first Baroque violinist ever to win this Avery Fisher Career Grant? Mm -hmm. Or even the first Baroque player, I think, right? Yeah. So that's kind of huge. I mean, that's like a big stamp of approval from like, you know, the establishment of classical music, I think, on what historic performance is doing right now. Do you see it that way or? Yeah, I think, I, I definitely see it that way. And I feel a huge responsibility <laughs> to <laughs> also like, because, I think, you know, even people say, wow, and now Juilliard has a historical performance. And um, I think people are beginning to realize that it's not, not just a, you know, niche thing that for some reason the stereotype is, uh, you know, failed modern <laughs> instrumentalists go to historical performance. And that's not true. Like, it's harder. Like, right. this, these, these instruments are harder. And if you don't realize that, you, you shouldn't judge it, you know? And uh, I, I'm really glad that it's getting the recognition. And I think this, this is only possible from, you know, the generations of people who are doing it before us who built it up to this point. And it's like really awesome to think about, like, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm also gonna interview Monica Huggett, who I think was one of your teachers at Juilliard and who comes yeah. to Valley of the Moon Music Festival as faculty. And, um, you know, she was like the cutting edge of all of this. And I think she maybe did the first recording of the Beethoven Concerto on historic instruments way back in the 80s, right? And it's like the best. It's seriously the best recording. And she is the coolest person. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she's such a rebel, right? So she kind of paved the way for all of us, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now that we're on the subject of Beethoven, it's the theme of the 2020 Valley of the Moon Music Festival. Um, the theme is really um, that everybody is kind of scared of him. All the composers that followed him were sort of crippled and paralyzed because they couldn't write their symphonies as well as him, speaking of competition. Um, can you just say a few words about just how you feel about Beethoven as a composer in general? Sure. Okay. I mean, I, I, I always, whenever I think of Beethoven, I have to go back to the first time I heard the, um, second uh the slow movement of opus 132 i think i was i was 12 i was 11 and i just remember like what is this like <laughs> this is the most beautiful thing i've ever heard mm -hmm. and um and then i started learning the beethoven concerto that same year for the first wow. time mm -hmm. and uh i was like i was like this is my favorite uh, favorite composer ever like so he's always just been an inspiration I think to me and uh, just his quartet writing, his different periods. Uh, yeah. And I think I'm so glad that this year, you know, people have been programming so much Beethoven. I'm also so sad that this, this happened, that we aren't hearing it as much. So I really hope that it happens because I was really looking forward to playing a lot of Beethoven. <laughs> I know. So that brings me to um, sort of the theme of these interviews is the idea of like, there's a fermata in music where, you know, like a, especially Beethoven used that a lot. And there's a lot of things that happen and then all of a sudden we're at this like complete stop and we don't know what's gonna happen. And 
Do you want to talk a little bit about this, this period in time right now? Lately, I've been really just excited to have this time to kind of, like, re, like, why do I love playing music? Like, like, answer those questions because, I mean, nothing gives me greater pleasure. And I think for you and for all the, for all of us who do this as our living, like we're not in it for the money. Like that's, that's the right, <laughs> we know that profession if you want to make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but like, I've been really um, happy actually. And I mm -hmm. hope that's, that's okay to say right now, but um, I've gotten more time to just play the pieces that I want to play. And like, I've been going, I've been learning more fiddling and I've, I, I'm like about to buy some bad bagpipes, I think, <laughs> because I've always wanted to learn how to play them, even though people think they're really annoying. Here we have this kind of like generosity of time and space around us, and we can just be more experimental maybe and explore more, like order the bagpipes or whatever. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. So what about, um, have you chosen some music to share with us that could go along with this interview and why did you choose that music and what is it? I chose a La Claire Sonata, the last moment tempo di Tracona um, of Opus 9, number eight. Uh, and I've always loved La Claire a lot because he's, you can, he can obviously play the violin really well by the way he writes. It's, they're very difficult and but I also just love the the mixture of his backgrounds and the Italian and the French going at the same time. And um, I chose this piece because, you know, I think people think of Chacon's kind of like simple in a way. And it is simple with the bass line and everything, but he writes these like, crazy virtuosic pieces over this chacon so i i thought it, i've always liked this movement Is that from? Is that a live performance? And who are you playing it with? And uh, okay. um, it's with my friend and harpsichordist Robert Warner. Okay. And uh, we're in Amsterdam in the Kleine Zaal. In the Concertgebouw. Yeah. Great. And it's like a really nice space. I really like that space. <laughs> um, and Isn't it uh, a beautiful hall. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I know that hall so well because I lived there yeah. for so long and and I just remember that hall of all halls like did you have this experience where like you just play one note and then you're like oh okay this is great like this is all gonna be good yep literally that's exactly what I thought when I, I started tuning because I used my <laughs> tuning to like figure out the hall and I was like oh this is gonna be great <laughs> yeah I know so the second video that you chose I think you're playing on modern violin is that right what what did you choose for us to hear um, I, I chose the second sonata by Schumann, and mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite pieces um, I've ever played. And I, I, I always notice people choose the first one. People always play that one. And I, I don't know, I was just drawn to the second one. And uh, I was lucky enough that um, when I was an undergrad, Anton Nell, the pianist, he, um, I think I was studying a Schumann trio with my trio in undergrad and he was like if you ever want to learn this piece I will play it with you and like I love Anton Nell like his playing is well as a person too it, his just playing is just like he's one of the best I um and so I was like hell yeah I'm learning that <laughs> so you can <laughs> play with me and um so I learned that and um just being like 20 and playing with him was just a really big like learning experience for me mm -hmm. um and at the same time i was kind of getting into starting researching like mental illness and mm -hmm. i i started learning about robert schumann and what he struggled with and like i like how i feel about beethoven it just when you learn more about a composer it just really makes you feel like you can connect with them as a human being and not this thing on a pedestal mm -hmm. and uh yeah and when you listen to this piece especially the first movement that i sent it's so stormy and like just mood changes like constantly like really long lines and then really short phrases and it's just like all mixed together and also what's really cool about the beginning part is uh, he based it off the Chacon by Bach, the D minor. Oh. And you'll, you'll hear it if you, you know the piece. And um, okay. it's just seriously the best sonata ever. Like each movement is amazing. And I like, I really want to play the whole thing with, with Eric. <laughs> oh, with the forte piano, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that'll be awesome, yeah. Good evening. <laughs> I'm really excited to be playing tonight. Um, we're going to be playing one of the most special pieces to me ever, um, the second Schumann violin sonata in D minor, the first movement. Uh, Schumann wrote this in 1851 during one of the peaks of his manic depressive stages where he was composing so much music. Um, he wrote this on the heels of his first violin sonata, and he wrote it in one week. Um, and if you ever hear the entire sonata, you'll see just how big this work is. Um, and he wrote that in one week. It's ironic that this piece, the second sonata, is not played as much as the first sonata, um, because Schumann is actually, he actually said that he wrote this piece because he was not happy with the first sonata, and this was his response to it. Uh, <laughs> but you can make your judgment call on that. I, uh, you can really hear the bipolar and the schizophrenia in this music that Schumann had. Um, he, you'll, you'll hear there's like a lyrical melody, and then the next second, it turns into this angular passage. And then the next second is back to the lyrical melody. And I mean, it's just full of this emotion and, and chaos, and I love it. Um, <laughs> uh, this, one more thing, this piece really has a very personal connection to me because when I first learned it, uh, someone very close to me was going through the same mental illness that Schumann was going through. And it really taught me learning this piece, like what, an inkling of what that person might be feeling and experiencing. And 
you know, there's periods of torment and chaos, and then there's a slight opening of the clouds, and there's this bright moment of beauty, and it goes back to the torment, and anyways, I really am excited to play this piece for you, and I really hope you enjoy it.
because you're right. I really only know the first sonata very well because you hear it so often and, and you yeah. never hear that second one. So thank you so much yeah. for sharing that with us. And, um, and the pianist playing is Andrew Rosenblum, who's, who's just, he just, he taught me a lot about the piece too. And he's great. He's so great. <laughs> and what were the circumstances that you were playing that together? Um, uh, we were playing at the Heifetz International Music Institute in Virginia, where, mm -hmm. um, where we met, and uh, I was there as a student. And I think what happened is someone had to drop out of the the concert. That I think I had three days to prepare it <laughs> with wow. him. And also at Heifetz, everything has to be memorized. Oh. So I had three days to memorize that and the other pieces that I played. <laughs> so it was really yeah. nerve-wracking. <laughs> yeah, and for people who don't know, I think Schumann is probably the hardest composer to memorize, right? Because there's so many crazy little quirky things that happen in different ways. Yes. Yes. You're amazing, Rachel. Wow. No. <laughs> um, well, I can't tell you like how proud we are of you and watching you develop so much over these last short few years that we've been working with you and just seeing you grow into this incredible artist and, and person. I mean, you always were amazing, but now even more so. And we are um, happy that you're enjoying your kind of pause there. And making use of it however you do and we're thinking about you and we're really looking forward to july yes <laughs> me too yeah i know so we're, we're going to be in close touch with you and thank you so much for this thank you tanya <laughs>